And then I'm going to turn it over to John. And um, I feel like a lot of you here would benefit from public speaking because you have a presence and awareness and wisdom. And that's why uh, one of the reasons why I really wanted John to come in on this. So, John, it's all yours, my dear. And thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, Liz. It's been such a pleasure getting to know you across the past few months and the way you showed up at Bold New World, sitting in that front row and just soaking it all in. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I want to acknowledge you for creating the space, too. This is really special, Mind, Body, Spirit Network. And when I think about what goes into being a community creator, it's really a deep love of people. So I really do acknowledge that. And, uh, the rest of us who will get to benefit from it, I hope we all see Liz in a similar light. I really appreciate her for what she's bringing to us. Um, and if you are here, I really appreciate you as well because this is such an exciting conversation that we're in. I believe, where this is a unique uh, juncture in humanity where people like you who really are here to make a difference in people's lives really stand to be the most prosperous as well. That's my core belief. In the past, there may not have been the structures for that, but times have changed. Oh, have they changed? <laughs> and now in 2017, I do believe that what audiences are craving and what they're willing to pay for more than anything is real genuine value and specifically from people whom they can know, like, and trust or come from a real authentic place or rooted in integrity and can really stand in their power and own their value as well. So that's the conversation I see that we're in and I'm really excited to be contributing to it. What we're going to be talking about today is how to use public speaking to grow your business. In my view, any business can use this in a dramatic fashion to really grow their business substantially. Um, a lot of people ask right off the bat, how do I know if my business is right for public speaking? I would say that if you've designed a fancy app and you're just showing the app to people, the app can pretty much do the selling for you. <laughs> if you've brewed the best cup of coffee of all time, then the coffee can represent your business pretty darn well. However, for the rest of us, where we make our living based on sharing our information, our expertise, then public speaking is perfectly designed. And you can kind of check in with yourself. If you've ever been at, say, a networking event where someone has asked you to share what you do, have you found that 20 seconds is just not enough time to share everything there is that someone might need to know about you and your business and what it can bring to their life? Every time I've asked that question, I've never someone, had someone say, 20 seconds is ideal. I love having those 20 seconds time frame. Thank God it's not a full minute because I wouldn't know what to do with that extra time. No. <laughs> Public speaking, having the dedicated format, usually 30 minutes to one hour, is really ideal. It's actually a lot easier than the quote elevator pitch. And that's one reason why it's so important since uh, so much of what we do is based on this authenticity and true connection with our audience and sharing our expertise and building up this personal connection. Uh, another reason why I strongly encourage it is it is the lowest cost way to market yourself. So to be clear, when I say public speaking to grow your business, I'm not referring to be, being paid to speak. So this is known as keynoting, where you might go into a corporation or a university and get paid to speak. That is a model that some use. Most who try to use it struggle a lot with it. So that's not what we're going to be talking about today. What we're talking about is using speaking as marketing or platform speaking or speak to sell. It's also known as. And in this model, uh, if you consider speaking as marketing, you would not charge someone to look at a piece of your marketing, just like you wouldn't charge someone to look at a Facebook ad or to look at a billboard that you posted on the highway. You would not charge someone to do that. You want to get as many eyes on it as possible. Well, it's the same philosophy with your speaking. You want to charge very little to come see you, if not nothing at all, so that you can maximize the amount of exposure. And then in that space, you're going to be uh, providing your speaking engagement to them and then creating clients from the room. And what I'll be sharing with you is the system I've used and our speaker country clients have used to reliably create 5,000 or 10,000 sometimes and more per speaking engagement. Yes, for one single 30-minute 
presentation, they're able to earn 5,000 or more from just that one presentation. So that's what we're sharing with you. So if that sounds good to you, you're in the right place. Um, the other thing is that I'll be sharing at the end, I do have a hard out at 10 a.m. of another appointment at top of the hour. So I'll be sharing with you how we can stay in contact because I know I might be throwing a lot of information and our Q&A time will be limited because uh, I really do have a lot to share with you today. So if you do have any questions, I would say don't fret about it. I'll be sharing you with a link of how we can connect one-on-one -on -one afterwards that can further support you. So before I dive in, I'll just share a little bit about myself. And I like to do this because well, as I share my personal story, as Liz knows, it's very deliberately designed. And as I share this with you, you can listen to it from a place of how this can be most relevant to you. And you can also, it's called the speaker geek hat, <laughs> listen for why it's designed this way, knowing my audience is comprised of speaker entrepreneurs. And then we'll do a quick little debrief uh, at the end around that. So first off, I'll start by sharing about myself that I have an amazing life. I truly do love the life that I have. I've spoken on 50, uh, I've spoken on 500 plus stages now. I travel around the country, uh, usually once a month I'm on an airplane presenting at a new conference with 100 plus people at it. I've personally mentored over 1,500 entrepreneurs to use public speaking to grow their business. And what really lights me up is that, yes, they earn hundreds of thousands of dollars that they would not otherwise perhaps earn in their businesses. That's exciting. The thing that excites me most, however, is really who these people become. It's their personal evolution. That's what truly lights me up. And when I consider whatever kind of legacy or imprint I'm leaving, it's really in who these people get to become. Decades of I'm not good enough or I'm a shy, introverted person. Who am I get up on stage? All those stories get put in the past where they belong. And as I would describe it, their true essence shines. That to me is the most beautiful uh, service to provide and the highest calling that I could see having. I'm also happily married. Um, uh, Liz has met my wife, Ronnie, uh, for the past three and a half years. Uh, we've been um, uh, husband and wife. We moved to Colorado a year and a half ago from San Diego, just on a whim. There was no logic driving it so much as we just felt a calling to be in Colorado and we just absolutely love it here. But before all that, I'll take you back to when I was 12 years old. At 12 years old, I got teased mercilessly. <laughs> I got called ugly every single day. My mother's Chinese, my father's white, so I looked different from the other kids. And while I think it turned out okay, <laughs> at the time, I just wanted to fit in with the other kids. On top of that, I also got uh, teased a lot for being stupid because I was a shy kid. I was in my head a lot. I thought about things. I wasn't quick on the draw the way other kids were. I liked to process more. So teachers and other kids just thought I was slower than the rest. So I found it really awkward to be around other people because we just couldn't connect. I spent a lot of lunches by myself when I was a kid. And at the time, I was thinking, well, what I want to do with my life it was something that had nothing to do with people. As far removed from being with people, because that's not working out too well for me, the whole being with people thing, I decided I want to become a writer. And since I love movies, that for me was screenwriting. And I share this all this with you just to give you a sense of how you might have this fear of speaking, or it's not for me. And just to tell you where I was, I was as far removed from wanting to be a public speaker as possible. So much so that I just said, I'm gonna make my living behind my computer. And that's the belief I had until my late 20s. After going to USC film school, I could do a whole other presentation of trying to break into Hollywood in my 20s. For our purposes though, I'll just skip to the end and tell you that at 29 years old, I moved back in with my parents and I had made no money from screenwriting at all. And at 29 years old, I felt like I was the world's biggest loser. And maybe some of you can relate to this tendency, how you can have one negative thought and it spirals into another negative thought, to another negative thought. So, well, at first it was, oh, this is unfortunate, <laughs> a bummer, I have to move back in with my parents. Then became, I'm a failure, I'm not meant to be successful in life. I'm not meant to do something I'm passionate about. These were the stories I had, like rampaging through my mind. What I did next was something I've seen a lot of people do when nothing else in life seems to be working. I discovered personal growth. So for me, that was going to seminars, reading books. The Secret was really hot at the time, so I rewatched that over and over on DVD. 
And when I went to my first seminar, two miraculous things happened. One was I met the woman who became my wife, Ronnie. And the second is I discovered that the reason we're on this earth, as far as I'm concerned, is to positively impact others. Through that, we find our happiness, our prosperity, life purpose, to really lead to positively impacting others. And I believe that's my core. So I decided to become a life coach. John Block Life Coach is what my business card said. I went to the networking events and did what's known as the spray and pray method, also known as the card dealer. You're passing out cards to anyone and everyone. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase. That did not work at all. People were avoiding me deliberately, feeling like oh, I was that networking mongrel that was not interested in conversations, just trying to drudge up business however I could. I think it was perhaps a Hollywood background. It's not what you know, it's who you know. That was the kind of guiding mindset behind it. Doesn't work so well in coaching. Doesn't work that well in Hollywood either, for that matter. So all my stories came roaring up again. I'm just not good with people. So at the time, you know, there's always some online fad going on, it seems. The online fad at the time was you gotta have a Facebook fan page. So I got a Facebook fan page going, got 100 likes, and I felt, yes, I have 100 likes. This is a big deal now. Like, here I am, world, I have 100 likes. I'm a major player. Only, oh, wait, I still have no clients and no income. What am I doing wrong here? So at this point, I bombed offline at the networking events, and I bombed online with the Facebook stuff. So I just felt, well, clearly this is evidence I'm not meant to be an entrepreneur. At that time, I started glamorizing the day job, feeling, well, I should just go back to Applebee's because that's the last time I had a day job. I could just do that. That's not so bad. I can just work up to regional manager. Maybe that's what my life is meant to be. But then I had that voice inside of me, and my trust is that if you're here, you have that voice inside of you as well that says you're meant for more. Sure, it hasn't worked out yet. Sure, there might seem to be evidence that it's not going to work out ever, However, there is that inner voice that says, don't give up yet. There's more out there. You're not meant to settle. I know you have that voice inside of you. And if I encourage you to do nothing else, it would be to listen to that voice. What that led me to do was to consider public speaking. And my stories came roaring up big time around that. My story of I'm not good looking enough, yes, that came as the very first one from childhood. My story of I'm not likable enough from all those networking events where I was irritating all those people. They couldn't stand to talk to me for even 20 seconds. That came roaring up. How could I ask him to listen to me speak at them for 30 minutes to an hour? The biggest one though by far was I'm not expert enough. Who am I to get up on stage and tell people I can help you live a better life? It seems so perfect. Just look at the shambles that my life was in. Who am I to get up on stage? It felt so inauthentic and out of integrity. And I felt like a complete sham, a charlatan. And at the same time, my sense was that I better start speaking or go back to Applebee's. That was the fork in the road. I had this notion that, yeah, speaking could be successful. I've been to seminars, I bought stuff. So that had to be the way to go. So I started speaking and I bombed horribly a few times. And I won't go into the details for time, but I could tell you some juicy stories of how I bombed on stage, like making offers that no one signed up for, that people were hostile to me afterwards. How dare you offer that to me? Other times I was way too passive and just saying, take a business card only if you want, no pressure, right? Just don't want to make you uncomfortable. Some of the mistakes that I made while bombing from stage. Finally though, I invested in speaker training and created my signature presentation and really found ways to align all these parts of myself, my heart, my uh, wisdom, my inherent wisdom, my desire to really contribute, my ability to analyze the problems that people face. I crafted it into a presentation. And the result was that even though it was sloppy compared to what it is now, I was able to earn $12,000 from that speaking engagement. So $12,000 in client revenue. And this is a system I've done again and again and again where I've earned $150,000 from one single speaking engagement. I've earned $20,000 at a five-person dinner mastermind. So from a conference, $150,000 to $20,000 at a five-person dinner mastermind, it's the same top. I've just modified. 
And that's why I created the company Speaker Venture, is to empower speaker entrepreneurs, conscious entrepreneurs who have a desire to impact lives to be able to have their own system for speaking so that they can have their own version of these results. We've had clients who earn 35,000 in their very first speaking engagement to clients, as I mentioned, who earn consistently 5,000 from their speaking engagements. And that's what I want for you, if that calls to you, to be able to have your own system as well. My belief is that when conscious entrepreneurs are fully expressed, then that is how we create a world where everyone wins. That's what I'm committed to. So I'm gonna pause now. And one thing that I know Liz knows about me is that I'm about 100% full transparency. My big pet peeves in this industry is, how, is the posturing and the hype and the phoniness. So I don't resonate with that at all. And the people I resonate with are ones who also want the transparency and want to really just give it to you straight. So having said that, I now want to hear a few quick shares on the personal story I just shared with you. Knowing that a personal story is designed to create credibility with an audience and it's designed to show humanity with an audience. Humanity specifically is what I mean. I've been where you're at and I can help you. Okay? I've been where you're at and I can help you. In our mentoring type industry, that's usually what we mean when we say humanity. So credibility and humanity, let's take a few shares. And Liz, how about you sit this one out? We'll give the others a shot, because you've yes. already done this. <laughs> uh, from credibility and humanity standpoint, what did you hear for yourself in terms of the personal story I just shared? I, I heard, you, you want us to just speak up? Yeah, go ahead, Marie. I heard that you're um, an average person that was trying to find his niche in the world and um, you tried, you were brave enough to try different things. And I, I, I tend to be that way too. I'm a, I'm a go-getter. I try things, they don't work and you know, we get dis disappointed and sometimes we get discouraged, but you kept on going and I just heard you say that, you know, you finally found it. Mm -hmm. Right, so what I'm hearing you share is the humanity piece of having failed repeatedly, whether it's going to the networking events or the Facebook page or bombing from stage, how I failed repeatedly and how I kept on going and was able to find a way through. And that would be something that you can relate to and be inspired by? Yeah, because I do the same thing. <laughs> okay, great. So again, I have no tricks over here, full transparency. The goal was to have you guys relate to it and be inspired by it. And it sounds like we did achieve that with Marie. Who else, in terms of anything else you heard, kind of in relationship, let's go to Linda. So what I wrote down, because it really impacts me, is when you said that you want to leave, when you said- I'm sorry, Linda, could you speak up at all? Okay. When you said that you want to leave an impact on people and teach them to love their life. That's yeah. What I because that's what I do. <laughs> Um, and also, like, changing your story, because, you know, I don't know if you usually say that, but that's what came to my mind. You know, it's time to change that story and live the life that we want to live. Right. Yeah. So we need to make it, you know, what we want it. So with all your words, that's, that's what was coming to me. Yeah, it's interesting because I may or may not have used the exact same words you just heard, but this is like a game of telephone, right, where Linda's going to repeat her version of what I said. And there's a power to it that comes from my sharing why I do what I do. Okay. That is the great unifier with the room. I've never empowered a speaker from stage to share why they do what they do and have people check out, get bored, or get turned off. <laughs> it's actually impossible <laughs> to share your big why you do what you do and not unify uh, people in the room because it's really so much bigger than a person on stage trying to peddle their services. I encourage you don't have that context when you get on stage. I have to quote, sell myself. That's not it at all. It's actually repulsive because if you think about it, do you want to go to an audience to watch someone sell themselves? No, that's not why you go there. So if you have the context, I'm going to sell myself, 
you're completely missing the audience in terms of what they're there for. However, as an audience member, I go to the, and a lot of people do, they go to the enroll the power it works the same way with going for a political campaign or something. You want to go to the higher vision. And as a speaker, yeah, you want to speak as well. Does well. anyone else hear that echo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put in my yeah, headphones. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, how's this? All right, how's this? Still bad. Still bad. Still echo. Still echo. It's not as bad though. Okay, I don't know why it does that. No, it's gone. Okay, hopefully it'll stay gone. Yeah, that's good. All right. So just to echo Linda's point, because uh, <laughs> echo pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to really share why you do what you do will really create this heart-based connection that will cut through whatever wariness or skepticism someone might have when they see you as a speaker. Um, we have time for one more. Alicia, was your hand up? Yes, it was. Yes. So the part that you, that I connected with was, you, you know, after you're speaking, many times you don't really get people coming up to you and really wanting to connect with you on a, uh, you know, further. In other words, they're not, excited about um, coming to you and seeing how you can affect them in a positive way. So um, sometimes when I am speaking, um, I don't get that, um, you know, where people want to come and, and um, work further with me. And I, I don't know what the disconnect is. So I'm, I'm searching for that. Good. I think that's a good segue to our next piece, which will actually be breaking down the signature presentation even further, because in this, you might be able to see some pieces that have been missing. Okay. Um, I know I give a lot of uh, value. I teach, mm -hmm. I teach an edu I'm a te um, coach educator, so I, I know I give a lot of value in my presentations. There's something where I need, I need to learn. Of yeah, that, turning that over into uh -huh. client, clients. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I want to acknowledge you, Alicia, for having the humility to say that you could get better. And one of my core beliefs is constant, never-ending improvement. Me too. Now, I'm a speaker trainer myself, and I just spent $6,000 to go to a training a couple weeks before the Bold New World event that Liz was talking about to work on my own speaking from stage. It never ends. And one of the things that really is unfortunate is when someone says, oh, I got the speaking part down. And I know this is not you, clearly. But <laughs> someone says, I got the speaking down. I just need to book gigs or get butts and seats for my events. And to me, there's a sheer arrogance that's really off-putting about those folks. And I've heard the expression that if you're truly a great speaker, you'll never have to wonder where the speaking gigs are because your phone's gonna be ringing off the hook. So I'm a big, big believer in the speaker training. And again, I just appreciate you speaking for all of us in terms of the need to constantly improve ourselves. We can always get to a higher level. So at the signature talk, the reason I wanted to bring this up with uh, this group today is that this is the essential system for using public speaking to grow your business. Okay? It really comes down to having the signature talk down. You could be uh, hosting an event and put all this work in and get 50 people, 100 people in the room, but if you don't have your talk nailed, then it's really a waste. It truly is. Or put all this energy into booking speaking gigs and then you get up on these stages and you are not able to really convert and have people coming up to you afterwards and signing up for what you're offering them, then that's also a waste of energy and people will fly all over the country and not have a tight talk down. Uh, it's baffling to me, actually. So it really does start with having your signature talk nailed. Now, there's three key components to your signature talk. The first is your personal story. The second is your contents. And third is your offer. So we'll go through those individually. The personal story, we've already pretty well covered. That's usually towards the beginning of your presentation as people are coming in and getting comfortable with you their biggest concerns an audience will have will be who is this person and why should I care or what value do they provide to me more accurately? Who is this person and what value do they provide to me? And can I trust them as well? We some of the top of my concerns that every single audience you ever face for the rest of your life will be having those concerns. 
coming in. So the personal story is designed to dissolve all those concerns, which hopefully my personal story did uh, with you guys earlier. The content piece is what happens next. I'll say one more thing about the personal story. Done right, when you really put the time in to craft the right personal story, um, and I say the right personal story because a common quandary that uh, speakers have is just knowing which personal story to tell. And someone might say, oh, I have so many low points. Like, I'm in a low point right now, right? How do I know which is like the low point, the vulnerability to really be sharing with my audience that's going to bring them in? Some of the things that I've heard people say. These are great questions to ask uh, because really there is the one right personal story for your core niche that really identifies what their biggest struggles are that the audience is going through and what their worst nightmares are. And you must speak to them in the context of your own personal narrative. So this is something we do in our program, World Class Speaker. We dive really in depth and handhold you through discovering the personal story that's right for you. Um, I'll say this just up front that uh, it has to be tied into the biggest struggles your audience is facing and their biggest hopes and dreams. You must do that. And that was the intention of my personal story to do that with you guys. Now let's move on to the content. The content is oftentimes the easiest part of your signature talk. And someone for someone like you, Alicia, who comes from an education type background, it's going to be the easiest part because it's just you out there sharing your knowledge, sharing your information. So we're in the content portion right now of my presentation because <laughs> I'm just sharing with you what I know. Um, the tendencies that someone might have uh, would be either to share too much, in which case your audience might feel, oh, I got so much from this presentation, I'm just going to digest the information and call you if I decide I need additional support. That could be one uh, effect. And if you haven't had that experience yet, yeah, you've had that experience. <laughs> I've had that experience. It's a very common one. So that's one way that you're getting the feedback that it's not really designed in a compelling way that clearly leaves people wanting to engage with you further. Um, the other mistake is that uh, another type of speaker would give too little information. And the problem with that is that your audience will feel, well, I didn't get much value from this, so why on earth would I get more value at the next thing? It does not set an auspicious tone. So we have to deliver really high value while setting up people for the next thing. Uh, I'll just give you a quick insight on how to go about this. You could do a, a system where you might outline at the beginning, are these are the three steps to get to whatever XYZ result your clients want to have. Have greater health, have greater uh, peace of mind, um, great relationships, improving their finances or their whatever situation that they want. So these are three ways that you, three things you could do to get there. That's how you would open up the content and then you would say, because our time is limited today, I want to do a deep dive on the first point, step one. And whatever that first step is, and step one just makes sense. It's the closest to where they're at right now, so it's more applicable. Usually the steps are chronological that you would outline for them. And then you do a deep dive into step one, and then your audience will feel, wow, step one was so great. I really want steps two and three. And the only way that they can get steps two and three is if they say yes to your offer. Okay, That's one way just to structure it, where it's really effective. Um, Otherwise, if you do deep dives into all three, then they might be uh, overfilled. Or if you skim the surface for time of only the three uh, points, then they'll feel like, well, that was kind of surfacy. I didn't really go deep with that. And why should I continue on? However, if you do um, the three point overview and then go deep into step one, that really is the ideal balance that uh, our clients have seen. So the third part is the offer. By far the most common mistake that speakers make with the offer is not making an offer. My belief it's a self-sabotage uh, technique, a subconscious self-sabotage, where it does combine two of the biggest fears people have, public speaking and sales. So what they'll do is uh, not make the offer because they ran out of time. 
right? Like they, the content ran too long, people were asking questions, and they just ran over time, there was no time for the offer, or they'll fixate on like one person's facial expression from stage and use that facial expression to psych themselves out as the speaker and say, well, clearly the audience is not into this, and I don't wanna make it even worse by offering them something at the end and damaging whatever goodwill I have accrued. Here's the essential reframe about this. This is a doctor-patient relationship you have with your clients. Right? It's true as a speaker and it's true once they're actually your paying clients as you're their uh, practitioner. And if we were to use an extreme example, I think this comparison will become really evident to you. Let's say there is a cancer uh, workshop and it's being hosted by a doctor who has somehow found a cure to cancer. And the people attending this cancer workshop are folks who either have cancer has a loved one who has cancer, or perhaps they're afraid of getting cancer one day themselves. That's why they're at this workshop. This speaker on stage is the doctor who has come up with a cure to cancer. Now, I invite you to consider, what if that doctor was afraid to come off salesy or awkward with the audience and hence withhold the, withheld the cure to cancer to his crowd? My sense is that you would feel that would be out of integrity for that doctor to do that, that he or she has a moral obligation to make the offer, to do something that they know will really transform lives. It's bigger than their own fears or self-doubts. Anyone who lets their fears or self-doubts override the cure that they can provide, in my view, is just uh, plain too small, right? You have to be bigger than that. You have to discipline yourself to see what the bigger picture is. It is about these lives. It is about the transformation. It's about honoring your years of study and erudition and expertise that you've accrued over perhaps decades, right? All that time you put in, you have to honor that as well by giving an outlet to share that with people so that it can reach its destination of transforming lives. Um, and yes, it is about the people whom you're here to serve. Your, your business exists fundamentally to transform others' lives. That's what it has to do. And the offer is the bridge to do that. And we have to make this bridge to cross as unimpeded as possible. We have to remove whatever roadblocks that are in the way. And when you've done your presentation in really a structurally sound way, and you show up from this heart-centered place, the offer is very straightforward. It's just about telling people what it is. You don't have to be hypey or salesy. You just basically say, there's a bridge. I invite you to cross it with me. Okay. So we have time for a question or two on anything I've shared because I went through this relatively quickly. So are there any questions or insights that you, anyone would like to share? I'll ask one thing. Go ahead, Linda. My problem is... I don't speak, but with my healing work, I'll over deliver because it comes from my heart and I can't not, I can't leave them in a place like after one hour. Mm -hmm. Like I know I always want to give more and more and more and more. Like how do you, how do you bring that in? You know I mean? Okay. So <laughs> let's be clear that we're talking about speaking as marketing. Right? You heard me say that at the onset, the speaking as marketing. So any piece of marketing is not meant to solve someone's urgent problems, right? Their greatest if pain. Had, if I were that cancer doctor, I would have given it all on the stage. <laughs> you know, and right. And then you would go out of business and not be able to cure anyone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would say not a sustainable approach, right? Yeah. So I would encourage you to be bigger than your own patterns. We all have patterns that frankly take us out from our greatness. I would surmise it's one of yours, and this is a sneaky one because it's so easy to justify this one. I really wanna take care of people, I'm one of the good ones. I really, 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 really care. <laughs> and that's the place you're coming from. But consider that it is just as unsustainable as a doctor giving out the cure to everyone there, right? It's also, if you actually think about it, not the smartest practice to try to cure everyone at the end of an hour long presentation because each case is different. What would make the most sense for the doctor to set up one-on-one -on -one appointments with every single person and then perform a diagnosis on them and at the end of the diagnosis, invite them to have the ongoing treatment. And that is what we call a magic session, by the way. That's typically the 
structure is that you would speak from stage and then invite folks into a one-on-one -on -one appointment with you because this is a doctor-patient relationship and it makes the most sense to perform a diagnosis then to really see how you can most help. All of our speaking has to come from our listening, okay? If you're trying to cure everyone from the front of the room, you haven't done enough listening because it's been largely a one-way communication. When you get into the one-on-one, -on -one, now they're doing the majority of the talking is the way it should be. And then you're able to bring your expertise to what they're sharing and then provide the best solution for them. Does that make sense, Linda? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Deborah, I think your hand was up. Yeah, the question that I had was about um, kind of resolving and, and reconciling how you resolved and reconciled the feeling that you're not enough of an expert. Um, that's one thing that I struggle with because, uh, you know, I'm really at the beginning of my journey. I've only, you know, I haven't studied for 20 years, but I still feel like I have plenty to give. Okay, this is a common question uh, and one that I dealt with myself. So here's what I think you can bottom line is that would you say, Deborah, at the end of the day, that you're people that you're here to serve, and you each have a group of people you're divinely put on earth to serve. It is physically impossible to have a calling to serve people and have there be literally no people out there to make the calling. Okay? So you can always find assurance that the people are out there. Sure, they may not be in your house at the given moment, but they are out there. So those people who are out there, would you say that you can stand behind the fact that they're better off with you than without you? Yes. Okay, got it. If nothing else, you can take comfort in that. That's what I took comfort in. Well, sure, I, I was declaring myself a business coach even though I had no success in business. I was a definition of what I used to judge as a charlatan, right? I thought, I should go off in some other industry, make a boatload of money, and then become a business coach. Then I'll have some credibility, right? But I didn't want to just wait for that. I wanted to immediately start coaching people. So I took comfort in the one fact that, okay, well, they're going to be fumbling around on their own <laughs> unless they work with me. And they're going to be better off. They're going to be less fumbly. I, of that, I could be assured. And I took comfort in that fact. And the tendency I had, too, was to compare myself to other coaches. Well, if they hire me, then that's one business. That's then they're sacrificing the opportunity to hire a business coach who's better than I am. That was a story I had. I don't know if you feel a similar way, but that was a story that I had. And there I go back to the principle I said around, you have the people that are divinely here for you at any given time. Okay. okay. If they were meant for someone else, they would have gone to someone else. <laughs> they're divinely here for you. Right? That's why the universe has put you together in this client relationship and they've showed up at your event to hear you speak. That was the divine appointment. And some of those folks have a divine appointment to become paying clients as well. And you can always stand behind that they're going to be better off with you than without you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And let me just add to you, the fact that you're even asking that question shows that you have a high level of integrity, which means that when you're being paid well for what you do, you will step up. Would you say that's true? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that puts you ahead of so many people right there. All right. Love these questions. Um, this is uh, something I have so much fun doing. I could just spend hours just being with you on this and have more energy at the end and the beginning. And one of my goals in life is to be 95 years old and still be uh, sharing and empowering people. And for me, it's a sacred privilege every time. Um, since time is wrapping up, Liz, would it be all right if I shared how we can stay in touch? Please do. Okay. So I just put in the chat box right now, I just want to make it as simple as possible. If you've gotten any value from our time today and you feel there's something worth further exploring, you'd like to further get your speaking down and you could see yourself on stages and consistently earning the $5,000 per speaking engagement, then I invite you to book a time with me and we can delve further into that. So this will be an opportunity for me to get to know you more and you'll be doing the majority of the talking and then I'll be providing the best solutions I can within that a lot of time. It might result in us working together um, and perhaps you taking one of our programs like World Class Speaker uh, or maybe just me providing a resource that could better serve you. Whatever the case is, I'm here to serve. 
because you're Liz's people, I'm happy to do this as my complimentary gift to you. So my invitation is if you feel the calling to delve further in this, you resonate with me and what I've shared, I can do a lot more when it's actually a one-on-one, -on -one, like customizable session. So I encourage you to just click on the link now and just choose a time that works for you. I have openings for the next several weeks. I'm sure you can find a 15 minute time slot in there that works for you. That'd be my recommendation before you get back to your busy lives. It's just to click on the link and then find a time that works for you. And you can click on that right now. It's live and the times are available and then you'll get a confirmation and we'll have a Zoom conversation like this all about you. All right. So having said that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Liz. Thank you for having me. John, um, <laughs> I'm going to continue with uh, answering questions from what I know about you. And I highly encourage all of you to take advantage of this. John is um, genius. And when I had my first conversation with him, it was like, whoa, <laughs> he's got insights and intuitions that were really impressive. So, John, I thank you for coming here today. And um, I'm going to provide some insights that I got out of uh, Bold New World with you. And um, just watching you work was really impressive during that whole time period. So I know you need to go, but I, I thank you. And uh, <laughs> we'll have a little chat with our gang here. And All right. Have, so, a great, have a great day, John. I thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yep. And ladies, just stick around for one second. Um, let me stop this recording real quick.